Um, I'm just absolutely thrilled with our keynote speaker, um, Bernadette Casey um, from the Formery. I've known Bernadette for quite a few years now, um, and it started with an article that I read about her, and then I found out that she was in Wellington, and I was just like, hey, I've arrived from Australia, and I don't know how this works, but could you come and talk to my students, because I just want to hear about your story. And she's like, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll come and talk. And I was just blown away. And I just, she's so dynamic and forward thinking and about sustainability and our planet and just a realist. And I just know that you will be so inspired from her early days of, uh, um, Thinking of, you know, from hat starting um, with uh, coffee sacks right through to today where she is taking people's waste and making new amazing products that are <coughs> sustainable and just so good for the planet. And I know when I've had my students listen to Bernadette, they've all been enthralled. And I know that you will be too. So I welcome Bernadette. Nicest introduction I've ever had. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we go forwards, I'd like to go back a few centuries and bear with me because I'm not good on these things. So, this is the goddess Athena, and the ancient Greeks worshipped her. She was the goddess of craft, of wisdom, and the goddess of war. She was the protector of sailing ships and the sailcloths that propelled them. She was the goddess of weaving. <coughs> and our industry, the one of textiles, is one of the oldest industries in the world, more uh, older than uh, stock breeding and agriculture. It's more ancient than bronze. Before we had metal currency, textiles were used for trading. It's our oldest and most enduring form of technology. Today's computer technology borrows from that binary system developed by um, Jacquard, uh, Monsieur Jacquard, we're making Jacquard cloth. And Bitcoin developers now use the term um, weaving instead of mining when as a metaphor for how they transact their trades on, the, on that socialised ledger. Our language reflects the profound impacts that textiles have had on society and on humanity. We talk about things, can you still hear me? I'll just turn this slightly, so I'm not leaning sideways. Um, we talk about hanging by a thread, of being frazzled, of catching a shuttle, of looming deadlines and spin-offs. <laughs> Textiles are so deeply embedded in the vernacular that we actually give very little thought to its genesis. But from its position at the cutting edge of technology for centuries, once one, what once was fashion has now turned into textile consumption. We're hitting 100 billion units of clothing that are produced annually. And New Zealand is part of this globalised system. We purchase about $5 billion worth of clothing a year, and that doesn't include our online purchases. Auckland Council estimates that about 9% of their landfill is made up of textile and clothing waste, and it's the fastest growing waste rate, which is alarming. Um, and putting our used clothing into the charity bins that you see around the place. What, we often think that we are um, making a charitable donation and while the charities receive a tiny, tiny percent of the value of that clothing, what we're actually doing is providing free stock for multi-million dollar businesses. And how it works globally and particularly in New Zealand when you put your clothing into the charity bins, about 30% remains on shore. That's the kind of the cream of the crop and that's resold through um, you know, second-hand clothing traders. The rest is offshore, about 70% of it. And most of our clothing um, goes into the Pacific Islands. Um, Papua New Guinea alone, we export $14 million of clothing a year. 
and that's donated. So every week that's two shipping containers that leave New Zealand and get shipped off to Papua New Guinea, where it's not a charitable donation, it's sold into developing nations. And the reason why this is a problem is this. This isn't actually Papua New Guinea, this is the Philippines. And um, it's quite hard to make out from this photo, but you might be able to spot a couple of people. I'm not going to walk right across the <laughs> stage and point them out. But there's a gentleman standing up on the far left with dark hair, and there's a guy um, sort of further north of him. So you can see why this is an issue. We, we're sending massive amounts of clothing into developing nations, and what it has done is it's decimated the local textile industry because it undercuts it. So you get this loss of skilled jobs. Um, you get this environmental um, issues because you can see on the waterway how close that is. So it's not hard to imagine the, with these clothes being outside, the leaching of cheap dyes and finishes, etc., into, into the waterway. So it's become quite um, an environmental and a social um, problem on a massive scale. So our products go into the Pacific, um, the US and Europe, their second-hand clothing um, goes mostly into Africa. And the issue is so bad that in 2016, the Eastern Bloc of African countries called for a ban on the importation of second-hand clothes. Um, and, and as a result, or kind of, a, um, yeah, as a result, um, the very powerful American rag traders lobbied the American government um, to rescind the AGOA trade deal, and at which point um, several of the African country buckled because you know, they're dependent on that trade deal. Um, so this is quite an issue. The clothing textile industry is one of the one of the most polluting in the world, and quite often they say the second most polluting, but there's actually no definitive data to back that up. But it is one of the most polluting. And the Danish Fashion Institute, um, their research shows about a quarter of 25% of all chemicals made in the world um, are made for the textile and clothing industry. The consequences of not addressing this vast um, scale of our waste clothing is that the problem could, could potentially be catastrophic. The demand for clothing is continuing to grow rapidly and if it, if it keeps going on the trajectory that it's on, uh, within, by 2050 it will be three times the size, so that's 300 billion units a year. And with that scale, it will um, use up over 20, over a quarter of our, um, our carbon budget associated with that two degrees that we're trying to stay under for global warming. Um, so moving away from this current linear and, and wasteful textile system is crucial if we're going to stay under that 2% two, um, 2 degree global warming limit. When you understand the amount of resources that goes into our clothing, our cotton, um, many of you will know this data, but a cotton t-shirt takes about three years worth of a person's drinking water to produce. Um, jeans take about 10,000 litres of water a pair. So it becomes crucial that not only do we address the waste of our clothing, but we also really slow down our consumption. And we use and reuse what is currently in circulation so that our clothing lasts longer. And this is where you as technology teachers come in. Um, we do this, you're doing a really brilliant job of, of building the awareness within your students and what used to be sort of industry knowledge we're now seeing, seeing come from students. Last year we had a meeting with Glassons and because of the pushback they'd had from their customers who are predominantly teenage girls, um, they had they joined the tier fund um, because the demand was there from those, you know, from young women for transparency and for ethical supply chains. Um, they said they're also getting uh, women come in and ask them what to do with their end of life text, uh, with the clothing when they're finished wearing them. Again, pushing back on those brands, and it's really great because 
It's coming directly out of schools technology. With the fast fashion industry, their demographic is teenage girls through to early 20s, which is exactly the demographic of their supply chains which they exploit. So not only is there kind of slave labour type conditions for young women at the start of the supply chain, but they're also exploiting the young women in the developed nations that are parting with their money to purchase these products which have fleeting value and then they have to dispose of it. So it's, so it's this demographic of women, well mainly women, I mean, there is fast fashion for young men too, but it's mainly young women that are exploited across the globe. Our clothing is far from inert. Recent studies have shown that over 80% of the world's drinking water is contaminated by synthetic fibres and plastics. And the issue around our clothing, if you're wearing synthetics, is when you wash them, um, they shed thousands and thousands of fibres that go straight into the waterway. Our wastewater system um, isn't refined enough to capture those fibres. And, um, and they go straight out to sea. And where it's more of an issue than a plastic water bottle um, is that they're already in a really refined form. So a plastic water bottle or other plastic goods have to break down before it's ingested our clothing um, because it's already fine. The plankton can absorb it straight away and then it gets absorbed up the food chain and into our food sources. At a German brewery, um, last year, a German research institute last year did a study of German beers and they have a highly regulated um, industry, as you can imagine. And out of 20 beers that they tested, 19 of them had synthetic contamination. So that's what we're looking at. It's really, it's a, it's, we're just starting to realise how big an issue this is. And while our domestic clothing consumption is eye-watering, um, commercial textile consumption is 40 times greater by volume. And that sort of goes under the radar. We don't realise, you know, that when you see people in uniforms, you don't particularly think about it when you, when you consider all the, all the sheets and the towels and the hotels and the prisons and the DHBs. The volume is immense. And from when we see images like the one we had previously, where our clothing ends up is, is, is equally as important as where it comes from. And there has been a lot of work in, in transparency around supply chains, around production, but nothing at the end of life of where our clothes are going. So how do we end up doing what we're doing? Um, over a decade ago, I had an interiors company and a friend of mine, Eric Dorfman, was a marine biologist and he was writing a book on global warming called Melting Point. And he was under pressure from his publishers to write another chapter. He invited me to write a book, uh, he invited me to write a chapter on sustainable textiles. And I knew the term, but I knew absolutely nothing else about it. So um, I had two weeks to research for this book and the research just blew my mind. The amount of waste textiles out, out there and here I was importing textiles from China. So we completely changed our business model and started looking at what waste textiles are out there. And New Zealand being the little coffee fiends that we are, there were a lot of coffee sacks. And so our first product was this hat um, made, made from an old Duke coffee sack and using um, the very best hat making um, hat, uh, hat maker that we have and so beautifully lined, beautifully constructed with an outer of this old Duke sack and, um, and at the time we were sharing an office um, with an interiors company and one of the women in the company was a interior designer from the States and one of her classmates was an interior designer for global um, coffee giant Starbucks. So through that relationship we managed to leverage our way in the door. We flew to Seattle to their head office and um, presented these hats to them and they hated them. 
<laughs> they said they didn't want to look like hot dog vendors. But what we didn't know was that they're actually at the time refurbishing their cafes worldwide and they wanted to look at incorporating the mass amounts of, of um, used coffee sacks into their interior design. So what resulted was a two year collaboration with them. We, um, excuse me, <coughs> we took the coffee sacks, we um, shredded them and blended them with wool to make a high quality upholstery fabric. Oh, yep, that one. Um, and that's Wojo, and um, America doesn't have much wool capability, so it became an international endeavour. We, we set up a supply chain out of Europe because it, um, it, uh, Starbucks have a really big distribution plant in Amsterdam, so it became this global endeavour. And we launched it in one of the Starbucks key stores in, in Mayfair in London. Um, had this massive launch, won an award from a sustainable development award with Prince, from Prince Charles and from um, Grand Designs, Kevin McLeod. And we were feeling pretty chuffed with ourselves, as you can see in this image. <laughs> Looking pretty happy. And then we saw the size of the production. And this is just one of six warehouses that they have. And it was just fast. And each of those sacks weighs a kilo, that's a kilo of jute. And, um, and we realised we had that sort of Fantasia moment, you know, the Mickey Mouse, where, he, where the water keeps coming in and he's trying to bucket it out. We realised that, you know, we could take 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 kilos of jute out there and it would make zero difference because it would just come flooding back in. So we realised that these individual projects we're not going to um, make any significant difference. So what we needed to do was take a systems approach to the issue. Um, a quick story back to the hats. This year, Vivian Westwood put out a range of accessories made from jute coffee sacks and really, really love it because when you've got a design goddess like that, it really, um, you know, making products from this waste stream, you know that it's really mainstreamed. And um, and one of the things when we put a new product to market that was out of a previous what's termed a waste stream, when we, we reform it and put it into market, it's then viewed not as a waste stream but as a resource. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a water. Um, yeah, so, so I'm reforming them, putting them back out to market, people view it differently and then they consider it um, a resource. So after we'd seen this, um, New Zealand Post were working on a, on a project re-engineering their used uniforms and um, they'd upcycled them into different products. But what they found was it wasn't scaling it because re-engineering re the uniforms, um, when the uniform's being used, one, it's generally polyester, which is not great for a start, but two, um, the, the textiles are halfway through their lifespan. Often they have pills and stains and sweat marks. So um, the actual sorting to find a piece of fabric that can reuse is very time consuming and there's huge amounts of waste. And then what it does, it, it, it lengthens the life of pieces of fabric for a period of time, but it doesn't actually deal with its end of life. So, um, so they brought us in to review the project and to develop a scalable model for, um, for uniforms. And the New Zealand Textile Reuse Programme was born. Anyway, so we established a textile reuse programme and we invited in corporates like in New Zealand, Fonterra, Sky City, the Warehouse Group, so we could have a, um, a volume of a known subset of textiles that we could be, that would be enough so we could support the whole supply chain for this end of life, um, and, and then plug in solutions. So our first solution is that um, it meets community needs, because although we've got 
clothing um, bins all over the place. Um, there's a disconnect and those clothes aren't going to the to people that need them and if you can't afford to put food on the table, you can't afford to buy clothes even from a charity shop. So um, uh, we've done a couple of projects trialling the system and the first one was taking uh, Wellington City Council's um, decommissioned rash shirts from their pools. We um, took the <coughs> excuse me, we took the logos off and and had a team of volunteers replace them with a with a little fish. And this these went in went out to um, <coughs> low decile schools and to foster children for the summer season. Um, and we've just done a project with Wellington Zoo and um, they've decommissioned their uniforms and where they've gone is to several places. One is Kiwi Community Assist and that is an organisation that um, supports communities. It's in Tawa, which is just uh, Wellington, and they have, um, they have a warehouse and um, they, they do two things. Um, one, they supply food and bedding and um, and food. They also have a they have a cool store as part of um, it's not foodstuffs uh, um, progressive the supermarket. So they have a big cool store, and at the end of it, they keep a bay for Kiwi Community Assist. So if the if the product's nearing its um, expiry date, they just move it from their cool store down a bay into Kiwi Community Assist. <coughs> they then put it onto their website and, um, and then a whole, a whole lot of charities connect to it. So it'll say, I have a box of apples, I've got a box of tomatoes, I've got a na na na, and then people just say, yes, I'd like this, yes, I'd like this, yes, I'd like this. So they, so for, for organisations that, uh, large organisations that have these resources, instead of having to ring all the charities individually, it just goes straight to Kiwi Community Assist, and then they act as the aggregator out into the community. And so with the zoo clothing, we have, um, we have had it, um, the branding removed by a local embroider who's just down the road from Kiwi Community Assist, and then it's going to go um, to them, and then people just put their hands up on Facebook and say, yes, we'll take those woolen jumpers, yes, we'll take that outerwear, etc., etc. Because the clothes are still very wearable, it's just that they've had a rebrand. Um, the other place that it goes to is Common Unity. I don't know if you guys have heard of them, they're in Nine Eye. And they started at um, Low De South School and they started using their unused soccer pitch to grow food. Their aim is to feed 2,500 children in the community, and uh, well, not just children, 2,500 people in the community, and they're fast on their way to achieving that. Um, they were in the news last year when um, one of the guys that works there is a Syrian man who was a market gardener and he started um, his own seeding business, and someone came in and just destroyed the whole lot, which was heartbreaking, and his family felt re-traumatised after escaping Syria. The whole community came together um, and had this really wonderful day and um, raised about $50,000 or $40,000 for him to re-establish his business again. And it was all over the news, and it was a really heartwarming story. So that's, um, that's where common unity uh, sit and they teach skills as well. They have sewing, a sewing room um, to teach those sewing skills. Um, they have a workshop, etc, etc. So we we connect and we, we, we act as almost an aggregator between businesses and these um, community organisations, social enterprises. Um, and that's our first port of call with textiles that can be reused. Our second one is taking them back to fibre form and being used as inputs into second generation products. But because our technology in New Zealand is around shredding, so you get a shorter fibre, um, they've got to be degraded products that goes into stuff like um, insulation and geotextiles and um, um, moving blankets, etc., etc. And we're in establishing 
a supply chain around it. They have more um, assurity around resource and supply. Whereas before, if you're decommissioning uniforms, they're often sort of about, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000 uniforms at once. And this can completely overwhelm um, a factory or an industry. So um, by establishing this aggregation of supply, um, you, don't, you get less of the peaks and the troughs, so it makes it more workable for industries that can use this resource. Our third stream for taking these textiles is um, relooping it back into production. And we've just, we're at uh, 50, Jan 50 June, we deliver a feasibility report around that, looking at these new um, fiber to fiber technologies, which is green chemistry that breaks down um, polyesters, synthetics, and um, down to its molecular form where it can be re extruded. Um, and the reason why, although we're not fond of polyester because of polyester contamination, but um, three quarters of corporate clothing is polyester, so we need to do something about it. And if it goes to landfill, it's got a very long life of hundreds of years, so a very long legacy. So if we can, um, if we can put it into the screen chemistry system, and then it can be used for molded products, from things like chairs and tables through to um, glasses, frames, you name it, anything, anything, because polyester is plastic, so it can be reused in that way. Um, so that's what we're looking to do with that technology and building the business case for its application in New Zealand. So while we have tons and tons of polyester, we may not necessarily have a, site, a, a market big enough to absorb what comes out the other end, so it might mean that that technology sits in Australia, but we'll find that out soon. Um, it's becoming imperative that rather than drawing on virgin resources that we use and we use what is already in circulation and in time we'll have little choice. And businesses really have to transform the way that they work to use less resources and to create less pollution and less waste. And the focus on resource management and re-engineering has become a crucial element in business today. We've seen the rise of extended producer responsibility and this extends the chain of custody over products and um, a producer's responsibility no longer finishes when it, the product walks out of their store. And what we're seeing from this is that um, this is driving the, the need for reuse because it's got to be economic for them. So from, for a technology teacher, um, if you want to understand what the jobs of the future are, then have a look at the, um, at the investment sites. So the, the, um, the startups and the accelerators that, um, that kind of nudge the, the, the new technology coming through. <coughs> And each industry has, has one, or has multiple actually. Um, for the agricultural industry, there's places like AgroLab and, um, just trying to think of America, I can't think of it off my head. Um, for textiles, it's Fashion for Good, which is based out of Amsterdam. So if you go onto their websites, you can see the types of businesses that are coming through. And, um, and for textiles, if, if you go onto that Fashion for Good, You'll see there are things like um, dyes made from um, microorganisms. There's um, textiles made from mushrooms. There's um, a new generation of packaging products. These chemical-free laundries, um, and and it really highlights that the text textile. Next textile evolution is not um, simply textile based, but it requires a whole raft of different skills from chemistry through to engineering um, and science designers and craftspeople and communicators as well. We've seen a rapid evolution in, um, in end of life, and as an example, Hutt City Council have picked up the Oversew Awards as the event of the year. And I can see someone in the room who's entered them before. And, um, and they're a really fantastic show. It's a fashion show um, based purely on re-engineering clothing. 
And if you're teaching textiles, I highly recommend that you go. This year is the last year in the wire wrapper before it goes to, um, to the Hutt Valley. Um, another interesting development is the, um, is the open sourcing of research. Because before textile research was mainly held within industries and on lockdown. But the Alan MacArthur Foundation I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, Ellen MacArthur was a, a, yacht, a British yachtswoman and she sailed around the world in a <clears throat> record few number of days. I think it was something like 70 days or something like that. Um, and while she was on her yacht, she, um, she became really aware of, of resource constrictions and then thought about um, global resource constrictions and limitations. And, um, and I was thinking, that, well, if you're on a yacht for 70 days, you've probably got plenty of time to think about these things. <laughs> and then I found out the, the longest time she slept while she was, while she was circumnavigating the world was 20 minutes. And I thought, oh, for 70 days. Anyway, um, so, um, so she, 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 um, circumnavigated the globe, and then she set up this Ellen MacArthur Foundation to look at how we manage our resources. And, and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has grown from three people to 150 people, and they now present at Davos, um, the World Economic um, Forum. They're an independent organisation, but one of the really great things about them is they open source all of their research. And what they're focused on in the last couple of years is textiles and plastics because of the profound impact that they have. And, um, and the research is available for anyone to look at. And the great thing about it, unlike university research, it, it comes with really, really great graphics. And um, it's understandable from um, adults, tertiary students, it's really sort of digestible information. And, um, and having those graphics of people that are visually orientated, like myself, it's, it's really good. And, and so it's a really accessible teaching resource. Um, in finishing, I just wanted to uh, go back to our spinning technology, which was, um, which was the catalyst of um, of the industrial era and weaving punch cards, the computer age, our, um, our high-tech fabrics and polymers have really extended mankind's performance. So each time we've had one of these textile revolutions, they've really changed society and it does feel like we're on the cusp of another one of those changes, a, a restorative textile revolution. And you as technology teachers you're a crucial part of that because the next generation is the one that's going to flow into this and they're going to be the solution providers and um, I just want to thank you all for the great work that you do. Thank you.